Welcome. My name again is Jeff Wyma. I'm a professor of New Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary. And in this session, we hope to uh, hear a sermon on the passage that we've been exegeting for some time, namely James 2, 14 to 26. And the idea is, is that you will see in the sermon that I hope to give to you a model or an illustration of how one might move from the study to the pulpit. Now, before we hear uh, from God in his word, we first pause for uh, a prayer, a prayer for illumination, because the scripture teaches us that the Holy Spirit needs to illumine, that he has shed light to our sin-darkened minds. And so let's bow our heads then in a prayer for the Spirit's presence and illuminating work. Great and almighty God, loving Father, we thank and praise you for your world. That even though you are a great and awesome God, far beyond our understanding, our knowledge and comprehension, you nevertheless are one who has revealed himself to us. Not only in your world, the creation, but even more clearly in your word, the Bible. So we thank you for the scriptures and the precious role it plays in our lives, the way that you reveal in it uh, your great works of redemption and how you've called us to be your children. And yet, O oh God, we are sinners, and we know that on our own strength and ability, we will fail to accurately hear and heed your voice. And so we want to do what you have called us to do in that word, namely to ask for the Spirit's presence. We pray that your Holy Spirit will so work in us that we may indeed hear your voice, that we may understand what it is that you were saying through the Apostle James to his readers so many years ago, but also the truth, that same truth that you are saying to us today. And so fill us with your Spirit so that we may hear, that we may understand, and also through the Spirit's prompting, we may live out and obey. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen. Our scripture passage, again, is James 2, 14 to 26, and it reads as follows. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. If the great reformer, Martin Luther, were listening to my sermon today, he would not be very happy with me, I'm afraid. And the reason Luther would not be very happy with me is not because I teach at a school who's got the name of another great reformer, John Calvin, written over its doorpost. No, the reason Luther would not be happy with me is because of my scripture selection. 
You see, Luther didn't like the letter of James very much. He couldn't find in it the heart of the gospel. And for Luther, that was salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And he looked high and he looked low in James and he couldn't find it anywhere. And as a result, he said, James is a letter of straw, right? It's lightweight. It's theologically wimpy. It lacks the heart and the substance of the gospel. And therefore, he wondered whether it could even be in the Bible. Well, if Luther didn't like James as a whole, he especially didn't like one passage in James, the passage that we're looking at now, namely chapter 2, 14 to 26. You see, Luther not only found the gospel lacking in this passage, even worse, he thought that James contradicted Paul. He heard in Paul a certain view of faith and works. And when he heard now the words of James, he said, James mixes these two up. He contradicts the apostle. In fact, Luther was so sure that James contradicted Paul, and he was so confident that it was impossible to solve this dilemma. He said, if anybody could do that, he said, I'll take off my professor's hat, give it to that person, and let him call me a fool. Well, I want to, I'm afraid, steal Martin Luther's professor's hat. Not that I need another one. And I want to call him a fool, though with some respect in my voice. Why? Because I believe, and I want you to hear in the message now, that James is not contradictory to Paul. I want you to hear the kind of faith that James is talking about. The same kind of faith that Paul argues for and agrees with, namely the kind of true saving faith that manifests itself, that shows itself in concrete actions and deeds. Now, to interpret any passage of Scripture, and therefore also a passage, a challenging one like the one we're looking at here at James, it's important to follow the principle, a principle I think you're familiar with, namely that every passage ought to be interpreted in its, I think you know it, in its context. Sometimes I say that context is king. Words can mean quite different things depending on their context. Well, that's easy to illustrate. Let's take, for example, the English word hot. Hot. Let's imagine you watch this video and you meet someone else who watches this video and that other person says to you, Oh, Wyma was hot. Now, wait a minute. What were they saying? Well, I guess it all depends on the context, right? It might be that I was perspiring greatly and sweat is dripping down my head. And so this person said to you, oh, Wyma was hot. Or maybe somehow in the sermon, I got really angry and I write, I kind of spoke with some righteous indignation. And so you say, oh, Wyma was hot. Or maybe you like this tie my wife just gave me and you like the way it's assembled with the suit. And you say, oh, Wyma was hot. You see, the word hot can mean different things depending on its context. And if you know the context, it'll be clear which of those three meanings the author or the speaker clearly intended. Well, it's not so different for our passage today. James uses the word faith and works, and and, and Paul uses those words too. But in order to understand them, we have to hear them in their context. Context is king. Paul... Not James now. Make sure we don't confuse the two. The Apostle Paul has one context. We overstate that this is the context because it wasn't always the case in his letters. But in a couple of letters, Galatians in particular, and in a lesser degree, Romans, in those contexts, Paul has a particular context in mind. He is writing to address a problem that we often call legalism or works righteousness. In other words, these are people who thought that they could score points with God by somehow being obedient to the law. And in that context, Paul has some pretty strong and negative things to say about deeds or works. That there are no deeds or works that we could ever do to somehow secure our salvation or to score enough points with God to cover our sins. For Paul, that's only possible by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's Paul. Not James, Paul. Paul. 
James now, not Paul, James has a quite different context in mind. James, who almost certainly is the brother of Jesus and head of the Jerusalem church and therefore in charge of the Jewish Christian churches of Judea and the surrounding area, has a significant problem of discrimination on his hands. We hear about discrimination today, I think, quite a bit. Sometimes we hear about gender discrimination, right? How, in particular, women are discriminated against in favor of men. We hear more and more about ethnic discrimination, right? How there is favoritism or there is negative judgments against one race because of the color of their skin. But James is not talking about gender discrimination or ethnic discrimination. James is dealing with social discrimination. Rich versus poor. It's clear from the context, and especially not just our passage, but the passage right before us in the first half of chapter 2, with which our passage is closely connected, it's clear that the church was either discriminating against the poor or neglecting the poor. In worship context, somebody wearing a fine-looking suit with lots of jewelry and bling-bling would come in and everyone would get all excited. they say, oh, wow, we were glad to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come right up here in the front. We have a special spot just for you. And then somebody comes in, you know, who lacks the nice suit and who doesn't have all the nice gold jewelry. And, and well, somehow they weren't so excited. They said, you know, um, good to see you, you know. Um, I think we have a spot for you uh, over here in the back, if you don't mind. And when there were judgments among Christians and when the church treated them in-house as they ought to, the church leadership always seemed to side with the rich, even though the evidence sided with the poor. And so James has indeed a serious problem of discrimination on his hands. This is a serious problem when you remember the summary of the law. Not only that we love God with all our heart, our soul, and our strength, but we also love our neighbor as ourselves. And James is thinking about that second summary of the law because he actually cites it just a couple of verses earlier. And so James, when he talks about faith and works... You have to hear him in his context. He's not just writing in an abstract way. He's not just sitting back one day and reflecting on the relationship of faith and works. No, he's a pastor of all kinds of churches, and he sees this serious, significant problem of discrimination, neglect of brothers and sisters, poor brothers and sisters in his churches. And in order to answer that problem, he writes the words that we're looking at today. Well, now that we know the context of James' argument, I think we're in a better position to look at the interpretation of James' argument. Now, how does James deal with this serious, embarrassing, significant problem of discrimination and neglect of the poor? What does he do? Well, he doesn't do what many preachers and some theologians claim that he does. Many preachers and other people read this text and they say, oh, that's what James is doing. He's contrasting. He's contrasting faith and works. However, I suggest to you that James is contrasting something else. James is contrasting faith and faith. That's right. He's contrasting more specifically one kind of faith with another kind of faith. He's contrasting first a negative faith that is impossible to save with a true faith that does save. And in fact, his argument is quite clear if you look at the passage. He starts off first with two negative arguments. How do I know that they're negative? Because he begins with the question, what good is it? What good is it? That's actually a fixed phrase in his day. And whenever people said, what good is it? There was only one answer, and the answer is nothing, not a squat. And so James is right away going to say something negative when he starts off by saying, what good is it? And he says it not once, but twice. And then he has another suggestion that he's going to start off with something negative. He says, can such faith save him? 
And here the Greek, which is the original language in which James wrote, is more helpful than our English translation. Because in Greek, you can ask a neutral question where the speaker is not sure whether the answer is yes or no, or you can ask a loaded question. We might call that a rhetorical question. In fact, you're not so much asking a question as you are asserting something. And that's what James is doing here in verse 14. He says, can faith save him? That kind of faith where somebody claims to have faith and has no works, and he uses the loaded answer, no. So it's clear that He starts off first with what faith isn't, or maybe you could say what a false faith is. And he's got not one, but two negative examples of that. And then in verse 20, if I'm driving a standard car, what am I doing? I'm shifting. Yeah, he has a major shift there in verse 20, and he switches and he balances the two negative arguments with two positive arguments. Two examples that not surprisingly come from the Old Testament, the faith of Abraham and the faith of Rahab. So let's follow the text in the same roadmap that James has laid out for us. And what that means is we begin with the first of the two negative arguments. And the first negative argument is found in verse 15 and 16. He says, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? The first example of faith is something that we can call all talk and no action. This is the kind of faith where Apparently, you see a fellow Christian who is poorly clothed and they have hungry and they're need. And then what do you do? You just say, hey, go in peace, right? You just utter some pious, empty cliche. And in James' mind, what kind of value is this faith? He says, what is the prophet? Remember, nothing, squat, no. Now, before we too uh, quickly blame the person who's offering this kind of all talk but no action faith. I want to suggest to you that I'm a lot more like that and and maybe you are too than we might realize. I mean, have you ever had this experience? I'm sure you have. You know, I, I, I see somebody and I say, you know, hey there, how are you? And then the person catches me off guard. They start telling me about their life, about some bad things that are happening in life and then inside you're kind of going, oh no, you know. I didn't really expect this. You know, I got myself in this situation. How do I get out? You know, what am I going to do? I don't want to look care, uncaring or unsympathetic. And then you go, oh, I know what I can do, right? You reach into your pocket for those nice Christian cliches, you say, for just this kind of moment, right? So here comes cliche number one. You say, oh, I'll pray for you. And then, of course, you say goodbye to the person and you don't pray for them, right? You're so preoccupied with your own life and your own concerns and interests, you forget about them. You don't follow up on that at all. Or maybe you need a backup one, an extra one. And so I've got one of those two. I reach in my pocket and I'll say, um, God will provide for you in your time of need. It sounds wonderful, but of course I'm blind to the fact that maybe God will provide for this person in their time of need by my meeting them, by my having this conversation, that maybe somehow I'll help them out. And James again says that that kind of faith that's all talk and no action is useless. Or as he says in verse 17, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Well, he's got a second example of what faith isn't, or maybe of what a false faith is. And that's found in verses 18 and 19. There's actually a problem in verse 18 that we don't have time to talk about. And so we'll just go to 19. We read, You believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. If the first example is of a faith that's all talk and no action, the second example would be all knowledge and no action. I mean, the demons have a certain knowledge about God. They have a knowledge that God exists and apparently that God is one. Because as soon as James says, you believe that there is one God, his Jewish Christian readers would have instantly heard in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael. Right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. 
It's something that all Israelites and therefore all Jews and Jewish Christians would know from memory, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And the demons may know that God exists and the demons may even acknowledge that God is one. But apparently that's not enough either because they respond by shuddering or in the original Greek text. It's a lot more stronger than that by by being scared, by being frightened, by being shocked. And the second example is an important one for, for me and maybe for you. You know, people like us who perhaps know a lot about the faith, right? We know a lot about the Bible. We know a lot about God. We know a lot about theology. I mean, we're the kind of people who know that uh, Habakkuk is Habakkuk. That's how you say it. And, and we don't have to have the pastor tell us on what page to find it. We can find it all by ourselves, right? And of course... There's nothing wrong with knowing a lot about the Bible and knowing a lot about God and being uh, being mature in our theological understanding. There's much, in fact, to commend for that. But as important as knowledge is, that in of itself, apparently, doesn't qualify as true saving faith. Well, James has given the two negative examples, two examples of what faith isn't. And so now he shifts gear here in verse 20 and he gives two positive examples of what real faith looks like, what saving faith looks like. And it's going to be a working faith. And not surprisingly, because he's writing to Jews and Jewish Christians, I should say, he cites examples from the Old Testament. Why not pick examples that they know about, that they'll find powerful and convincing? And although James doesn't tell all the details about Abraham and Rahab, he doesn't need to. He can assume that they know the back story of Abraham. James can assume that his hearers know that he wasn't always called Abraham. He was called Abram. They know how God called him aside one said and said, Abram, check out the stars in the sky. Check out the sand and the seashore. That's how many your, de- your descendants are going to be. And that, sounds, whoo, that sounds pretty impressive. In fact, your descendants are going to be so numerous, we're going to have to change your name to Abraham, father of a nation. And so Abraham, who doesn't really know this God, he, he's kind of intrigued. He's kind of impressed. And apparently he has faith to, to follow this God and to go to a foreign land. And, and he's waiting for this prophecy of becoming a father of a nation to come to fulfillment And he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and nothing's happening. Maybe I have to somehow help God along in this process. Maybe I have to have a a relationship and sleep with my wife's help. No, I guess that's not it either. And so Abraham continues to wait. And one day he's 99, and God comes to him and says, it's time. And so Abraham somewhat understandably laughs. Yeah, right. And Sarah's 89. And God comes to her and says, it's time. And she somewhat understandably laughs and says, right. And it is right because she conceives and gives birth to a boy. And they have to name him Isaac. What else but to call him a name that means laughter? How precious is a child to any parent? How much more precious is a child to parents of advanced age? How much even more precious is a child like Isaac on whom a whole future nation is dependent. And then comes the news, the awful news, news that we can't even hardly understand, where God comes to him and says, Abraham, take your son, notice the words, your only son, the one whom you love. Oh, right. And then take him to the mountain of Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice to me. Christians for centuries have tried to understand the significance of this command. It's really difficult, if not impossible. Maybe some of us, and and I'm afraid I'm one of them, maybe some of us who've lost a child and know the pain and horror of the death of a beloved son or daughter may maybe have a little bit of an inclining of the kind of emotions that Abraham was going through. But Abraham apparently has faith, so much faith that he raises the hand, and at the last moment, 
God provides a deliverer. And then James says, did you see it? Did you get it? It's right there. That's faith. That's what real faith looks like. And James apparently says, it wasn't just this one thing that Abraham did that proved his faith. Remember, I tried to stress it. Maybe you didn't catch it in the reading in verse 22. We read, you see that his faith and his actions, actions, plural. So it wasn't just this one-time act of offering Isaac, but it was throughout Abraham's life, his works, his deeds regularly testified to the genuineness of his saving faith. James has a second example, the example of Rahab. And again, he can assume that his hearers know the backstory here too. A backstory which highlights again how significant Rahab's faith is. But I was a little puzzled, though, by the choice of Rahab. If you think about it for a moment, it does sound a little strange, doesn't it? I mean, Abraham, I can understand. That's a no-brainer. I mean, why not pick Abraham? He literally is the father of the Jewish nation. I mean, there are no Jews before Abraham. That's why we sing that annoying hymn, Father Abraham. He is the father of the Jewish people. He's really the top dog in Jewish circles, if you will. But, you know, Rahab, I mean... Who is she? Well, one, she's not a Jew. She's a Gentile. Two, she's a woman. I know that doesn't sound very politically correct, but in that patriarchal culture and age, that meant something. And three, she was, well, maybe the worst kind of woman. She was a prostitute. I mean, boy, it's kind of hard to get worse than that unless you somehow give her leprosy to boot. And yet I think that James has deliberately picked these two because they're extremes. It doesn't matter whether you're the patriarch Abraham or the prostitute Rahab. It doesn't matter whether you're a seminary professor or a student of the Bible watching this video. It doesn't matter who you are. The call to true faith is exactly the same for all of us. All of us are called to have the kind of genuine faith that shows itself, that manifests itself in concrete acts of obedience, and especially in this context, kindness and love and generosity to those who are hurting and in need. And so James can conclude by having this analogy, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The body needs to come alive through the infusing presence of the spirit. And similarly, deeds are an essential part of a living, saving faith. Martin Luther, the great reformer, did not like the letter of James. And he especially didn't like this passage that we've been looking at, chapter 2, 14 to 26. But I like this passage. I think it's especially relevant for the church, the North American contemporary church today. Why? Well... Because the church has changed, sometimes in positive ways, sometimes in not so positive ways. One way the church has changed from yesteryear is its ability to articulate its faith. Christians today are much more free in giving a testimony and speaking openly about their love for Jesus and what God has done for them. And that's a positive and encouraging thing. If I think about my grandparents, for instance, they, they would probably struggle, right? Uh, they could speak about their faith, but they wouldn't do so eagerly or so openly. They certainly wouldn't, in a public worship service, be willing to step up to the mic and give their personal testimony. But even though they couldn't speak about their faith very much, they certainly showed their faith. Man, did they ever demonstrate their faith. I mean, well, for example... They grew up in the Netherlands during the Second World War, and during that time they hid a Jewish boy. 
And I trust you understand the serious implications of what would happen if you were caught hiding a Jew. He was someone in need. They could have justified it and said, hey, I have to look out for my own interest and the safety of my family. But they did that. They did show love to their neighbor. They immigrated to Canada after the Second World War and and they ministered to all kinds of people. And I only found this out after the fact because they were so modest, of course, about what they had done. These are grandparents from my mother's side of the family, so they couldn't tell from my last name that they were my grandparents. But on a number of occasions that I preached in different places in Ontario, Canada, when people found out that I was a grandson of Garrett and Klaska de Schifford, well, people not only broke out in smiles, many of them literally cried. They literally cried because they would tell me, sometimes through their tears and through smiles, about how my grandparents helped them because they too had immigrated and how my grandparents either lent them money or farming equipment or let them live with them for a while while maybe the husband went ahead and made arrangement for a new job and housing situation. And I remember later in life when I had the privilege of having my grandparents come and visit with me in different places. You know, I would hear them pray at night in Frisian, right, in their native dialect. You see, my grandparents, their actions were crystal clear in testifying to the genuineness of their faith. Now today, though, it's just the opposite. Today, again, we have Christians who can articulate their faith, and that's, again, a good and wonderful thing. The scriptures say that we ought to be able to give an account, a defense for the faith that is ours. I think it's healthy that when when people make profession of faith, they just don't say yes or I do to some questions, but it's a positive thing if they can maybe write or say in their own words what their Christian faith and commitment means. But I'm afraid that that faith, which is sometimes so eloquently expressed, is not so always faithfully lived. I've had opportunity as a pastor and as an elder to, you know, visit people and ask kind of personal questions about, you know, uh, your faith and how do you uh, implement your faith in your daily life and how does your faith you know, interact with your job or with your vacation and things like that in your home life, your marriage. And, and the answers often are not so encouraging. And that's why I like James. That's why James' message is so desperately needed by the church today. James has very little tolerance for people who are all talk and no action. Instead, James presents for us a very vigorous working faith, the kind of faith that impacts every single thing we say, think, and do. I mean, our faith will impact the kind of movies we choose for Netflix to send to our home. Our faith will impact how eager and cheerfully we put money into the offering plate or support other Christian causes. Our faith will impact how how quick we are to spend time on our knees in God in prayer. Our faith will also influence how motivated and how committed we are to hearing God speak to us through His Word. Our faith will impact, as a young person, the kind of person we might choose to date and potentially marry. Our faith will will also impact the way we refer to members of the opposite sex, what things we find appropriate and not appropriate. And our faith, especially in light of this passage, will also greatly impact how we respond to those who are hurting and in need. You see, dear friends, that faith, wait a minute, what kind of faith now? Not a false faith, but wait a minute, a true faith, a saving faith, will literally impact every single thing you say, think, and do. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word and the way that it speaks to us and our situation today. Not just to that of James Day, but to our contemporary world and how we now as your children and followers of Jesus are called to live. We pray that we may be a people who by the infusing presence of your spirit
have the kind of faith that James desires in his readers. We pray that your grace will so work in us that we're changed, that we think differently, that we speak differently, and that we act differently. Oh God, may our conduct at home, at work, at play, at church, May all the things we do in every place we find ourselves and with no matter whom we might be, may our faith display itself in concrete and specific acts of obedience and especially in context of need of kindness and love and generosity. Work that kind of faith in us through your word and spirit we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.